God bless. God bless you. God bless everyone. Blessings upon you. Certainly grateful for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. It is Wednesday. And if it's Wednesday, it's Word Wednesday. Time for a word from the Lord. And certainly grateful for all of you that are joining in and logging in on today. Thank God for each one of you and for your being a part of this uh, <clears throat> Facebook Live um, Wednesday Bible study. We call it Bible Institute Hour or Word Wednesday. And we're certainly grateful to the Lord for all of you. I'm excited about uh, anticipating um, uh, returning to our sanctuary um, in the month of June. Um, just stay tuned. There'll be more information given to you as the governor lifts uh, all of the restrictions June 1st, which was uh, yesterday, um, the outdoor restrictions were lifted uh, by our governor uh, of the state of Michigan and then anticipating that July 1st, the indoor restrictions would be lifted without any type of encumbrances or any type of restrictions upon our gatherings. So I'm trusting and praying and hoping that you're getting vaccinated, want to push for vaccination. I um, uh, hope that uh, the people of the Lord and those who are returning um, in our membership, that you will be returning being fully vaccinated. Uh, the vaccination does not, is not a cure to the COVID-19 virus. Um, and it really doesn't stop you from um, uh, obtaining it. However, uh, it is 95%, 95 to 97%, depending on which vaccination you receive, um, protective against you getting the vaccination, but and if you get it, I'm, so, I'm sorry, against getting the virus, and if you receive or get the virus, uh, then the consequences and the um, physical um, hardship is not or should not be as difficult, and certainly prayerfully not not fatal, uh, and perhaps not not as complex if you had not received. The vaccination. So I'm encouraging everybody that can and will. I'm pushing. I'm fully vaccinated and have been fully vaccinated for some time. I think March 2nd uh, of 2021 was my uh, va vaccination date. I think it was February 2nd and then March 2nd was the second dose. So we're grateful to the Lord for all that he is doing and for all he's done. want to jump right into Bible study. Um, we're still in the Pentecostal celebration mode, uh, still teaching on the Holy Ghost. Uh, last few Wednesdays, uh, we gave you um, real, real good sound biblical teaching uh, on and from the, the perspective of God's holiness and the holiness of God. Went into sanctification uh, uh, last Wednesday or two Wednesdays ago, uh, completed it, talked about the process of sanctification, about regeneration, justification, and sanctification, a regeneration changing your nature. Uh, uh, justification changing your standing with God and sanctification changing your character and conduct and making our lives and our behaviors and our actions uh, approved, uh, approvable um, by the standard of God's word. And um, we preached from the, on the day of Pentecost about um, Pentecost then, Pentecost now, and ministered again. Uh, uh, thank God for ministry, our home minister last Sunday, but the Sunday prior to that, uh, uh, again, looked at um, uh, the power and move of the Holy Ghost at the beginning of a new era. And I want to continue in the teaching in vain of talking to you about the Holy Ghost. I want to give you um, just a kind of overview, biblical overview uh, of the Holy Ghost and its significance and, and moving to the point of teaching and talking about how to receive the Holy Ghost in its, in its fullness. And um, um, I want to share that with you on tonight. There's a Bible verse in 1 John. Uh, let me start with a biblical basis. Um, the epistle of John, the, the letter of John, the apostle, his first letter, uh, chapter number five. Call your attention to chapter five and verse number uh, seven in particular, which um, lifts up the whole idea and concept of the Trinity. Uh, the word Trinity itself is not found in the scripture uh, uh, in terms of by, by its word or by um, its clear uh, pronunciation and saying. However, certainly without a shadow of a doubt, the teaching of the Trinity, uh, the um, doctrine of the Trinity 
is uh, found in a multiplicity of verses uh, to lift up the idea and the concept of God's, uh, the triune, the triune Godhead, uh, the three in one, uh, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In 1 John chapter number five and verse number seven, uh, the Bible is replete and the Bible speaks from this, let it speak for itself. Um, uh, it tells, tells us um, um, that there are there are three that bear record uh, in heaven. Uh, I said First John chapter five verse seven. I'm reading a different, the, the wrong. I turned to the wrong passage. But First John chapter five verse seven is the correct verse, and um, it reads: For there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. All these three, the Bible said, and these three are one. There are three that bear record in heaven. Heaven only knows from a divinity perspective, uh, 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 heaven records and heaven ascribes and heaven signs off on uh, the idea, the teaching, the concept, the, 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 the fact of the Trinity. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, uh, the word, the word, capital W-O-R-D, which is Jesus Christ. We get that from St. John chapter 1, verse 1, that talks about the Logos. In the beginning was the word, the word, the word Christ was with God, and the word was God. It talks about the pre-existence of the word of being Jesus Christ, the Logos, the equality of the word with God, uh, and um also, the, 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 the equality, existence of, of Christ and pre-existence of, of, of Christ, the word being with God. And so John picks it up again and says that there are three that bear record in heaven. Uh, and then the, the, the significant point of this verse, he ends it with the last clause of saying, and these three, are all three are one. So uh, there is a a threeness in the oneness and the oneness in the threeness. There is a triune, there's a tri, uh, tripartite aspect to the Godhead, the Godhead representative of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. Bible uses both terms um, in the King James Version and other versions, equal and equivalent, synonymous to, to the same. One is spirit, one is ghost, um, but the same person, speaking about the third person in that Trinity, in that Godhead. And we believe in one God. We do not believe, sometimes we're misrepresented uh, as saying that we are uh, polytheistic, meaning many God folk, many God believing folk. We're not. We're monotheistic in our faith and our belief, meaning singularly uh, uh, that God spoke to the Hebrews in uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Well, I think it was the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy and said, I am the Lord your God, and thou shalt have no other God before me. And, and God spoke throughout Old Testament time to establish with our Hebrew, with the Hebrew brothers and sisters and the, and the Jews of, of Old Testament time that um, God was monolithic. God was uh, monolithic, I should say, uh, 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 monotheic uh, uh, um, from the perspective of we believe in one God that is eternally existent in three persons. One God that's eternally existent, that exists eternally, always has existed, always will exist, uh, and in three, he exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God has chosen, brothers and sisters, to make himself known. He's chosen to manifest himself, um, his his, his triuneness, his threefoldness in, in the earth, he's chosen to represent, to make known, to make available, to manifest um, uh, his triuneness by emphasizing and highlighting uh, his actions and his works uh, um, in various um, spheres and seasons and time frames of man's existence. I'll say it again. This one God that eternally exists in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost has chosen to make himself known, to manifest himself uh, in the earth uh, by emphasizing um, his, the actions and works of his divinity. 
during various periods and distinct periods in the existence of man in the earth. Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, one thing I mean in the Old Testament, when you study and look at the Old Testament and God's actions throughout antiquity and from its origins and beginnings of creation, the Bible speaks very emphatically and very focusedly from uh, the Jehovah, God Jehovah perspective, the Elohim, um, the God of the El Shaddai, the God of um, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the singular God. It speaks about Jehovah. There are many compound names given to God in the Old Testament to, uh, to, to depict God, Jehovah God, as being a healer, to Jehovah God as being a battle axe, Jehovah God as being um, a warrior, Jehovah God as being peace, Jehovah God as being um, a provider, Jehovah God as being uh, the healer of all their ills. So it, Old Testament basically represents God's dealing in the earth from the perspective of uh, Jehovah, from the perspective of God himself involving, creating the heavens and earth. The Bible in the first chapter of Genesis, the very first book of the a verse of the Bible. It does not try to argue or debate the existence of God. It emphatically st starts off by saying God created. In the beginning, God created. It says, in the beginning, God. The first four words in the Holy Scripture, in the Holy Writ, establishes the existence of God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God, God created. And it goes on to talk again about God's actions and works and deeds, manifestations in the earth, basically in Old Testament. Second uh, uh, display, second dispensation, second actions of God making himself known uh, to humanity uh, occurred at the birth of Christ, at Jesus's incarnation. Uh, uh, the seed of the uh, of this God, the seed the Holy Ghost planted His seed into the womb of the Virgin Mary, and she brought forth a son um, that was begotten of God, birth of God, God's only birth son, begotten of Him, full of grace and truth. Um, Mary was not impregnated by a male or human being, but by the Holy Ghost, which came upon her. Power of the highest overshadowed her. The holy thing which was born in the womb and formed in the in the womb of Mary was called uh, the Son of God. So when Jesus was birthed, um, um, somewhere around three or eight, three or four B.C., um, Christ was God's representative, was heaven's representative in the earth. He walked the earth. God, Christ became the Emmanuel. He became God with us. God in communion with humanity, God um, uh, in human existence. Uh, God, Christ, Jesus did not cease to be God when he became human, but he uh, added humanity to his divinity. Already existent, eternal, the scripture we read in 1 John 5 and 7 tells us there are three that bear record in heaven. Uh, and so Jesus is already recorded eternally or part of the heavenly record, the triune, uh, the, the, the threefoldness of God. He took on flesh and came in human form. When he lived and walked and breathed and moved upon the earth, brothers and sisters, he didn't come in the earth, upon the earth to stay, to be, to remain eternal in his human form, in his human uh, uh, presentation. But he came to, to die for the sins of man, to pay the pardon, the price for sin, and to be resurrected from the dead with all power to ascend and go back to heaven from which he came. He fulfilled that. He did that in a time period of 33 and one half years. Jesus walked the earth. It was Jesus, God's son, God the father, took on human flesh and came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the, in the flesh. Jesus uh, is uh, the only person of the Trinity that embodied humanity. God the Father, and I know it's, it's technical, and I hope I don't lose anybody uh, on this teaching of theology, but it's factual, it's biblical, uh, it's kind of splitting hairs, but it, you have to understand that it was 
God's son, Jesus God's son, who took on human form and likeness and came in the shape of a hum human being so he can become the savior. It was Jesus, God's son, that died on the cross because God cannot die. You cannot kill him. All right, no way you can kill God. However, because Christ uh, submitted himself and yielded himself to the will of the Father, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. He submitted himself. Death could not have uh, killed Jesus or had any power, dominion over Christ, unless Christ yielded. He said by his own testimony, Jesus said that no man takes my life, no man kills me, no man has the power uh, of life and death over me. He said, but I lay it down. If I lay my life down, I would take it back up again. So it was Jesus, God's son, that walked on the earth during that 33 and one half year period of time, uh, um, and which ushered in the New Testament period, the time of grace, the age of uh, God, God's grace and God's uh, giving and love through his son, Jesus Christ. But he died, he rose again, he stayed alive for 40 days, and then he ascended and went back to heaven. In Acts chapter 1, you'll find his ascension verse where the men, the, the followers, the disciples, the multitude were standing and gazing into heaven. And an angel spoke out as Jesus was being elevated and taken up among, among them or from them. And the angel said to the men, why are you standing looking and gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus who you see being taken up from you will come again back unto you again one day. So when Jesus left the earth, he was at that point, 33 and a half years, heavens represented it in the earth. But Jesus made a promise to his disciples, followers, and to us that I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you without a helper. He told them in the gospel of St. John, read the 14th chapter and the 16th chapter of St. John's gospel. You'll find that Jesus told them that it was to their benefit. It was for their expedient. It was expedient King James ver Version language. It was necessary, beneficial, advantageous for them that he would leave the earth. Because why? the reason why it was advantageous and benefit because while he was in the earth, Jesus succumbed and, 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 and submitted himself to the rule of nature and to the rule of human existence. He could only be in one place at one time, though he was fully God and yet fully man, fully human. He uh, became bound by the limitations of every humanity or every human and could only be with them one place, one time, one position. He rested, he got tired, he slept, he needed to uh, rest, he had, he had to eat in his human existence to keep from the human perspective, though he was fully God. And so because he was bound in human limitations, he could only be with them one place at a time. But Jesus said, my purpose, my goal for coming and the will of God is not for me to stay and just be limited by human uh, limitations of one geography, one place, one locale at a time. I'm going to leave and go away. It's to your benefit that I leave. Because if I do not leave, the Holy Ghost, which he called the Comforter, will not come. But he said, if I go away, I will send the third representative of heaven that John said is, is recorded, the Holy Spirit. I will send him unto you. We studied for a couple few weeks in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, in the entire chapter there, in the second chapter of Acts, that Jesus kept his, kept his promise. The Holy Ghost did come. Jesus did send the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came and dwelt in the midst of those first 120 believers who were in the upper room. That was the celebration of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost, the feast and festival and celebration and high holy day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place. They were all with one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. This was, four, this was 50 days after Jesus had been taken up and caught up and left. But God filled the earth and filled, amen, uh, the uh, time frame, not with Jehovah uh, the Jehovah God living and existing and breathing and acting upon the earth, not with Jesus, his son, who had already left and, and ascended back to heaven, but with the 
third person of the Trinity with the Holy Spirit. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and thus, and these three are one. So now the ushering, the time period for the Holy Ghost to come and dwell in the earth happened from the Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost, uh, when Jesus left the earth for, and it was gone 50 days, 50 for Pente, 50 in the Greek means Pente, uh, Pentecost, and 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, what Jesus had promised and what God had planned for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to dwell, indwell believers and to live on the inside of every believer and to be the, 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 the comfort, the paraclete, the one calling on the help, the influencer, to be God's aid and assistance and the power and presence and peace and person of God who abides in the hearts of men and women who would accept him by faith. He came to dwell permanently in the hearts of men and women and th therefore to live permanently in the earth. Right now, uh, on June, what's this day? June the 2nd of 2021, we're living during the time and dispensation in the age of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, of the enabling of, of, the, of the power and presence and the peace of the Holy Ghost being at our disposal and with us and in us and for us and acting on our behalf to fulfill all that God desires for his spirit to fulfill. So we're at this point in time where this is the dispensation time period and phase of man's existence and, create, and, 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 and human creativity that God's spirit is dwelling in believers. The Holy Ghost is among us. Now, you have to understand, without me going into depth and detail, uh, I'll probably give you some verses you can read and look up yourself. The Holy Ghost always existed because there are three that bear record in heaven. He, God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. And the Holy Ghost is eternal. God has all power. Jesus has all power. Holy Ghost has all power. God has all wisdom. Jesus has all wisdom. The Holy Ghost has all wisdom. God is omnipresent, present everywhere at the same time. Jesus is omnipresent uh, in, his divinity, every, in his divinity, everywhere present at the same time. He just could not fulfill that while he was in the flesh because he was limited by human limitations. The Holy Ghost is omnipresent, present everywhere and everywhere present at the same time, abiding in, within us. But in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit existed and because he is a part of the tri the 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 the, the, the triunity of God, the God here, the part of the Trinity, certainly he moved and operated. The Bible says early in the book of Genesis uh, that it was the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the deep. It was the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Ghost, that moved upon the face of the deep and caused things to occur and happen. Um, many uh, many manifestations, many, um, many, many displays, many, um, uh, many uh, uh, awarenesses of the Holy Ghost and exploits and miracles and performances, if you will, of the Holy Ghost occurred in Old Testament time. Persons were moved up on and, 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 and were visited by the Holy Spirit himself. Moses in Numbers 11, you read in the 11th chapter of Numbers where Moses uh, was was impacted and moved on by the Holy Ghost. Gideon in Judges chapter 6, 6th chapter of that judge by the name of Gideon, did what he's able to do by the enablement and empowerment of the Holy Ghost. Samson in Judges chapter number 14, uh, Samson was endued and empowered by the Holy Ghost. Every time Samson got ready to perform or to do something that was of an exploit or miraculous or needed the strength. It was the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord moved up on Samson. It was not Samson's hair that gave him his strength. His hair was a uh, indicator of the vow and commitment that he had made with God being uh, a Nazarite not to cut his hair, but it was the power and enablement of the Holy Ghost that moved upon Samson. And you can read that in the 14th chapter of Judges. David uh, was anointed uh, often and many times by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost came upon David, uh, even in the Psalms and even in 1 Samuel 16 chapter and anointed David, uh, uh, gave David an, anoint, an anointing 
that allowed him to um, play in such a way that he cast devils out of Saul. Uh, Elijah received an experience, an endowment, an endowment, a visitation of the Holy Ghost in 2 Kings chapter number 2, uh, where the Holy Ghost moved upon the prophet Elijah. So all these indicators and others that I did not mention, you know, to, there, were, there were times and displays and there were moments, if you will, and there were special um, occasions and special dis uh, displays of the operations and works of the Holy Ghost in Old Testament time that, that moved up on persons who God chose and deemed to, 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 to showcase and to experience Amen. The power of the Holy Ghost in their lives to perform certain miracles, to perform exploits, to perform certain uh, uh, certain feats that were supernatural, that were God inspired, that were Holy Ghost in, infused, that was uh, directed and led. But here's the thing: in Old Testament, all these instances and persons I named and others I did not reference. When the Holy Ghost came in Old Testament time, it moved up on persons. It allowed them to accomplish a specific task for which it came to empower them and, or to anoint them. And then the Holy Ghost left them. It did not, it did not stay and re, they did not retain or the Holy Ghost did not stay and maintain its presence in the heart and lives of these individuals of Samson and David and Saul and Elijah and Moses and Gideon. Um, and, and, and the prophet Elijah, but it came, endowed them to do uh, wonders and miracles, and then it was taken, the Holy Ghost was removed from them. What God prophesied and said to the prophet Joel in the second chapter of Joel, he said, it shall come to pass in the last days. I'm not going to sprinkle out my spirit. I'm not going to assign my spirit for designated tasks and for specific instances. I'm going to abundantly pour out my spirit upon not specific individuals, not certain classes of people, not individuals who God would use here and there to uh, perform miracles. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all, A-L-L, -L, all flesh. That's everybody. Uh, everybody, I will pour my spirit upon everybody, upon all flesh. And he said, your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Old men are going to dream dreams. Young men are going to see visions. He said, even upon your handmaidens, your servants, upon those who are who are who are who are in servitude and enslaved, and those who are who are working and though laboring, he says. The Holy Ghost would be available and made available to every person who would receive him and every person who would ask and hunger and thirst and believe uh, to receive the fullness and the endowment of the Holy Ghost living on the inside. God said, I'm going to pour it out upon all flesh, all flesh, all flesh, all flesh, A-L-L. -L. When God says all, he means all, all Humanity, all flesh uh, is susceptible and able and exposed to and can receive, amen, the wonderful gift and operations and, and the wonderful endowment and, and, and baptism and infilling and impact of the Holy Ghost. Uh, God said he would do it. God meant what he said and God performed what he said. Again, Acts chapter 2 uh, is, is, is indicative of that happening uh, in a great, great, great way. And not only the Acts chapter 2, but when you read the whole book of Acts, the book of A-C-T-S, Acts is the book of, I said this before, it's the book of the Acts of the apostles who really did what they did by the actions of the Holy Ghost. And the book of Acts is really uh, uh, the, the, about the disciples, the followers, the believers of Christ receiving what Jesus received. I told you in the last week, read scriptures and showed in John where Jesus uh, was sanctified. He, he said in, this, in, this, in the high priestly prayer of the 17th chapter of John, Jesus said, Father, um, I sanctify myself so that these also who you've given me may also sanctify themselves. And so Jesus sanctified, the Bible said Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. 
and went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease uh, around him. And so Jesus spoke to the, to the um, Pharisees at one point and said, are you talking about me whom, the one whom God has sanctified? So he testified of his sanctification. And so Jesus, the book of Acts is about us believers receiving what Jesus received, the power of the Holy Ghost, so that they, they would do what Jesus did. It was a, it's an it's a expose of the workings and operations and the manifestations of the Holy Ghost given to believers who asked for it. Uh, there are five accounts in the book of Acts uh, and I want to just briefly go over these. I won't go at length and I'll go in detail on next Wednesday night uh, to really delve into a little bit more of the more intricacies of these five instances. But the book of Acts provides five different accounts of people receiving the fullness uh, or the infilling and dwelling of the Holy Ghost um, uh, in their lives. Um, Acts chapter two. I'll give this to you, and maybe and not maybe, but I'll give this to you next week, next Wednesday. We'll delve into them, but you can have a little homework to do, a little reading if you want to read ahead. Get your pen, get your pencil. Read from Acts chapter two, verse four, which we have referenced many times before. Second scripture in Acts chapter eight, the second occurrence of the Holy Ghost, a person's, in, uh, you know, receiving it from in the Acts of the Apostles uh, 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 narrative is the eighth chapter, book of Acts, verses 14 through 25. Acts chapter eight, verse four, verses 14 through 25. Third occurrence is the ninth chapter, book of Acts. In Acts chapter nine, you'll see and read about another occurrence of the Holy Ghost uh, where Saul was filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter nine, verses 17 through 20. Uh, then the fourth occurrence in instance is the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, which really becomes known as the Gentile Pentecost. Um, Acts 2, the Jewish Pentecost, Acts 10, Gentile Pentecost. But in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, <clears throat> there was a man by the name of Cornelius who was, who was of the Italian band, mean non-Jewish. Um, the 44th chapter verse through the 48th verse, Acts 10 chapter, 10th chapter, verses 44 through 48, is, is another occurrence of the fourth occurrence of persons receiving the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. And then the fifth occurrence is found in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, where Paul went to the city to those who were in Ephesus, in the city of Ephesus, and asked them, had they received the Holy Ghost since they uh, first believed? They, re they, they responded, we haven't even asked. We haven't even heard, I'm sorry, whether or not there be a Holy Ghost. Um, I believe that the believers in Ephesus, in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, are so similar to uh, believers that we have today, unfortunately, in the New Testament church, uh, in the church of uh, this 21st century, that there are many who have believed in Christ and do believe in Christ and have have embraced the message and the and the and and the meaning and the redemption of salvation in their hearts and souls and are fully amen um, fully uh, uh, in concert with with what they know to be God's word but have not taken that next step have not advanced to the next level of receiving the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost it was such. Read Acts chapter 19. You read it for yourself. First seven verses, verses one through seven of the 19th chapter book of Acts. Fifth occurrence where persons again uh, received, there were certain disciples there who received the Holy Ghost. They were water baptized. And I, again, I, I'll, I'll save my, 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 my detailed uh, 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 discourse and, and, and expositional uh, 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 entry or, or, uh, or look into the into the meter, the, 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 the more detailed meat of these five occurrences, because I don't want to get bogged down into it, but I just want to give you an overview. And what's interesting in these five accounts, um, uh, I want to share with you that there were, um, in each one of these accounts, there were five things that were manifest. There were five indicators. All five of these accounts uh, seem to follow the thread of from these five accounts, what we can gather and what we can uh, kind of highlight and lift up and what I want to again share with you 
uh, in, 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 in closing out this evening, this Wednesday night, uh, that those five accounts in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 25, the third occurrence of Acts chapter 9, verses 17 through 20, the fourth occurrence of Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48, and then the fifth occurrence in the book of Acts, the 19th chapter, the book of Acts, the first seven verses. There are just five observances. There's five uh, summary uh, statements I want to make of five, I, I think, uh, definitive actions that we see when we when we when we study and peruse all five of those and other instances in the book of Acts concerning the works of the holy workings of the Holy Ghost. In these accounts, there are five things that seem to jump out at us that are that are manifested and made known. Number one, when you look at these five in totality, the first thing that that stands out in reading those five accounts that I just gave you scripture reference to. Uh, there seemed to be, and there was, brothers and sisters, an overwhelming, an overwhelming uh, 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 inbreaking, or overwhelming exposure to God's presence. They experienced uh, a overwhelming uh, supernatural or spiritual experience of the move and power of God that was present in their life. So the first observation of all those five, these five manifestations, the five different displays and presentations of the Holy Ghost working in the book of Acts is number one, it was so apparent and very, very, very apparent that there was an overwhelming presence of God's power or God's persons that these persons experienced it personally. Second observation to be made out of those five scriptures is that it was very evident, very, it was, there was a very evident and a very factual uh, transformation that occurred in the lives of these persons who were impacted by the Holy Ghost in these five instances in the book of Acts. Uh, again, the first one was there was a super, there was a, a overwhelming evidence of God's presence personally being experienced, but secondly, it brought about transformation. The power and presence of God in these five instances um, strongly brought about an evidentiary transformation in the lives of the believers and the witnesses and the disciples who experienced the move of the Holy Ghost. The third out of five observations to make or to be made uh, make that I want to make regarding these five instances in the book of Acts is that um, it's interesting that, that what they experienced uh, became uh, became the impetus, this transformation, overwhelming experience and power of God, it became the impetus, the reason, <clears throat> the motivation uh, for the growth that occurred in the early church. Their personal, overwhelming, overshadowing experience of God, the, the transformative uh, experience of nature that occurred became the impetus and the motivation uh, for um, what God was doing to grow the church, um, grow the church daily in the temple in every house that, that the Holy Ghost moved upon. They did not cease to, to practice and to assemble and to delve into the teaching and, and doctrine and practices and fellowshipping uh, of the apostles that they received. The third thing that is evident um, uh, from these passages of scripture is that um, what they experienced, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I said the third thing was what they experienced became growth for the church. The fourth thing was that uh, there was an immediate evidence uh, in five, uh, three of the five accounts that I gave you in Acts, in three of the five, three of the five that I listed in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 17, I mean Acts 9, Acts 10, and Acts number chapter 19, three of those five, there was an experience of glossolalia. There was an experience of speaking in other tongues or speaking in an unknown or a language, I should say, that they had not learned. Uh, that was a significant uh, uh, manifestation and significant sign and significant display that something transformative, something spiritual, something heaven sent was being was, was, was being endured or endured or experienced by these followers that they spoke with another language, another tongue. 
call in the technical sense glossolalia, glossolalia, here we call it speaking in tongues or speaking in other tongues, tongue speaking, and that certainly occurred. I'll deal with that in a little detail on next Wednesday. Uh, it, it occurred in three of the five instances of those scriptures that I gave you. You'll see that as you read and study it for yourself for more edification. And then this tongue talking, this uh, glossolalia means to speak. Um, uh, 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 the fifth thing that occurred, um, that observation from looking at these five instances was that uh, the ultimate purpose, the whole overall purpose and ultimate purpose of this experience of the empowerment and being empowered by the Holy Ghost, the ultimate purpose was uh, for them to uh, become a witness for Jesus Christ. The ultimate purpose was for them to have a deeper uh, dimension, deeper experience with Christ so that and to communicate that experience to others who they came in contact with. The fifth ultimate, all of these instances you'll show forth that as a result of the, the transformative experience, a result of the speaking in tongues, a result of the uh, overwhelming evidence of God's presence with them and among them, as a result of the transformative uh, 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 nature and occurrence that happened when the Holy Ghost, ultimately it led them to witnessing and to disseminating the gospel and testifying to others and telling the world of their commitment to Jesus Christ uh, and, 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 and it led them to a sense of gratitude, a sense of humility, a sense of fruitfulness that was fruit bearing, them receiving the Holy Ghost and it, it brought forth much fruit as the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter five and et cetera. And that's the, that's a, that's the best uh, overall kind of overview that to give you I want to give you tonight on this word Wednesday stay tuned stay more I, 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 I feed you here a little there a little line up on line precept up on precept you got to stay tuned and be a part of the continuum of this teaching uh, so that you can be able to embrace and digest uh, I want to share with you that uh, if if you feel that uh, if you don't get everything that I share and teach with you from the biblical perspective in one setting that uh, the good news is we keep our Bible study and our worship service uh, videos out on Facebook under our Christian Gospels and Facebook page. You can always feel free to go back and peruse and go back and revisit um, something that you at your own time and leisure so that you can have great edification, receive great uh, not only just information, but uh, the real uh, understanding and illumination from God's word so that you can grow thereby. So thank God I want to share that with you tonight. I'm going to end and stop here. Bless God for each one of you listening in and looking in. Thank God for you. I pray your blessings upon your home and household and your family. Again, Christian Gospels and all those that look in and that are part that are here locally in Detroit, Michigan. I want you to get ready for our reopening of our in-person worship service. Uh, our ministers and ministers' wives are being asked to be a part of our service this Sunday coming, first Sunday. We're going to come back in in phases. Uh, hopefully, we're coming back in with all that are vaccinated, uh, pushing everyone to have their, get their, receive their vaccination and the help uh, for our, uh, what they're calling, uh, uh, you know, a herd immunity, the gathering that we can all be in a safer environment. And I'm asking the ministers and ministers' wives to lead us out. We will be the first to return back to the sanctuary this first Sunday uh, in June, a uh, couple coming up this Sunday. Then after the ministers and ministers' wives return, I'm going to ask that the leadership team prepare themselves, our auxiliary leaders and de deacons and those who serve in ministry capacity, our leadership team and spouses return, prepare to return back uh, uh, the following Sunday or two, the second and third Sunday, and then uh, I want to then open up finally to the populace of our congregation, the ma the mass uh, congregational, every member of our church, to after the leadership team comes in for you to um, uh, make preparation to be a part and to gather in person once again. Come get ready. I know it takes takes time for transitioning our minds and transitioning our hearts. I know that you've experienced and been able to, uh, at your leisure, 
and in your own in for, your own clothing and and uh, in your own uh, the comfort of your homes to receive rich word and experience the Lord. But remember, that was not our norm. Uh, our, we want to return uh, to the sanctuary and let God create with us, with us a new normal. God's going to give us a new normal and create in us. It won't be the same as old before, but it's going to be a new normal. And uh, we thank God for we embrace all that the Lord is doing. May God's blessings be with each one of you until we meet again, prayerfully, hopefully this Sunday. I pray the peace of God upon you. And I pray that God's strengthen and God's blessings be a part and favor rest upon you and your family. Won't you share a love gift tonight? Won't you give uh, as God has blessed you to give? Uh, I thank God I, I am able to give and I'm a giver every time we meet and don't meet. Uh, I have an automatic reoccurrence gift that automatically through push pay. You can go to push pay and search on Christian Gospel Center, pushpay.com. You'll locate our uh, app and our uh, uh, ability, our, our way of giving to our ministry. You can do it through, through Cash app at CGC Kojic dot uh, C, well, actually, dollar sign CGC Kojic is our Cash app identifier. And then you can also thirdly get just mail in if you don't have the technology if you're not as astute if you haven't gotten there yet you can just physically mail your tithe and offerings into 19901 kentucky detroit michigan 48221 and god will bless you for your all your gifts whatever way you give it shall be a blessing pronounced upon your gifts and i thank you in advance for all you shall share and our sharing Go in grace and go with God and may God bless you until we meet again is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen.